We come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you tonight that we can be in your house, and Lord, that we can study your word and have your word give us wisdom and direction. We just invite your Holy Spirit to have his way in this place tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.
against him. And Lord, we can be free. We can be victorious because of what you did for us at the cross. We just thank you for that tonight. Hallelujah.
worship you tonight. We thank you, Lord, that though you are high and holy, God, you choose to have relationship with us through the sacrifice of your son. We thank you that we can get as close to you as we want to tonight if we come by faith. And Lord, we just pray that you'll move in this place, move in this time of Bible study. God, I pray that your word would stir up faith in our hearts tonight, faith to go further, faith to be more the people of God that you want us to be. And Lord, we just surrender our hearts to you. We submit to you. Have your way in the remainder of this Bible study tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Chapter 12, um, let's, read, uh, let's read verses 1 and 2, that's the first section here, and then we will uh, look at the packet tonight. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Alright, how many of you have ever read uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, or excerpts at least, for, at least from Fox's Book of Martyrs? It's a very interesting um, book to have in your library, Christian library, if you don't have it, um, just to read some of its history that the Bible doesn't talk about, but um, all the disciples of Jesus, um, with the exception, I think, of John, and they tried to kill him, um, were martyred for their faith, and so to hear the history of that, um, it, it's incredible, um, and you realize how incredibly blessed we are. Uh, we call a sneer or a snicker persecution in our country, and probably 80% of the world, if they name the name of Jesus, they're in fear for their life. Um, so we, we really ought to be thankful for um, you know, what we have in this country, even though we're losing it quickly. Uh, we ought to be thankful for the freedoms and, and uh, the liberty that we have to share the gospel, and we better recognize the time is short. Um, but are we willing, like like these first disciples, to lay down our lives, if that's what it took, uh, if that's what it takes for us in uh, in our lifetime, that could change very rapidly. Um, you, you've seen how quickly things changed in just recent events with COVID, with um, major tragedies in the world. Things can happen very quickly, and uh, we better not have our faith. I've said many times, we better not have our faith as Americans that. that we are a superpower, and that nobody can touch us because we're a superpower. If that's where our faith rests, that may change before Jesus comes. And um, it's, it's, it, we are in a very volatile, um, vulnerable position right now, today. And I don't think there's anything um, making it look like it's gonna get a lot better anytime soon. And so we better pray for our country, pray for the freedoms that we have, not just for our comfort and ease, that's not what it's about. Of course, so you can have money in your pocketbook, that's how most people vote, is based on their pocketbook, and that's why we have the mess that we have, amen or only. Um, but we need to realize this gospel still needs to go forward. There's still people that you know that um, they need an adequate presentation of who Jesus is and what salvation is all about, and um, and that they need an opportunity to, to, to turn to the Lord. And that comes, that's what's most important. It comes with the freedoms that we've enjoyed in this country. And we ought, to, we ought to pray that way. And you'll see in this New Testament church in the book of Acts, they didn't have those freedoms like we do. And they persisted, and God blessed them. Amen. He blessed them and gave them grace, um, even in spite of uh, what was going on in their, in their culture. Um, so let's look at this. James's martyrdom, verses 1 and 2. James's death occurred under the reign of Herod Agrippa I, the grandson of Herod the Great. All right, meetings were conducted between him, Herod Agrippa I, and the leadership of Israel, with them encouraging his action in this regard. So the apostate church would join with the world to stop the move of God. Regrettably, it oftentimes continues in the same vein presently. So, a secular ruler, just like they did with Jesus' arrest and his crucifixion, they went with religious leaders, and that's how James ended up being martyred and being killed, because of the cooperation of people in the church that were supposed to be leadership. And so, um, history tells us that. That's a, that's a scary thing. James, the first of the apostles to meet martyr's death. He 
he was um, the first one that, um, that faced that that fate. And um, there's a lot about his history um, that is uh, significant. The Book of James, written by him, um, is such a practical Christian guide for how we ought to live our lives and the struggles that he had um, accepting Jesus as the Messiah, accepting the things that happened um, after Jesus' death even. It's, uh, it's interesting that he persevered to the end and did not renounce his faith. He was martyred and held to his faith to the very end. And, uh, and that's uh, commendable. And that's probably why the gospel continued to go forward is because uh, of the blood of, of Christ's saints. Um, Satan thought he could win by killing him and he really just made the gospel spread even more. And uh, we need to rest in that. Mark 10, 39. Can someone read that for us? Mark chapter 10, verse 39. They said to him, we are able. So Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink. And with the baptism, I am baptized with you will be baptized. All right. So you remember this story in Mark 10? Um, it was James and John's mom, really, that came and tried to establish some kind of a position for her sons in the future reign. And that they had a lot of things mixed up in their head about this future reign. Uh, we can see that from what Peter did to the servant of the high priest, right? Remember what he did? Took his sword out and cut his ear off. And they thought that Jesus' kingdom was going to be an earthly kingdom, that he was coming as the conquering king in his first advent. And they had missed all the prophecies that talked about him coming as the suffering servant, as the one who would go to the cross. And so um, possibly James and John's mom was in that line of thinking. I don't, it doesn't really tell you that a whole lot, but that's possibly what she's thinking. She's trying to secure a spot so before this thing gets all stirred up and this warfare is what they're thinking is going to happen, Jesus is going to, by force, establish his kingdom. That's what was in a lot of their heads. She wanted to make sure that James and John were in a, a secure position. And moms do that, don't they? <laughs> they look out. But Jesus tells them that, um, he, that she wanted one on his right hand, one on his left in glory. And, and that could be in heaven. That could be maybe she had a better understanding than I'm giving her credit for. But there was a lot of confusion about Jesus' first advent and his second advent. When he comes the second time, he's not going to be meek and lowly and riding on the back of a donkey. He's coming on a war horse at his second coming. And those who have been raptured will be riding with him. That's you and me. And then you want to be, yes, on his right hand and on, on his left because he's coming to execute judgment once and for all. And um, so whether they had all that straight in their heads, you know, we think we have it all straight now. We probably don't have it all straight, but she's asking um, because she wants to make sure her sons are in the right spot. And Jesus tells them here in, this, in these verses, he says, you don't know what you're asking for. For them to be in those positions, they're going to have to drink of the cup that he drinks of. He's talking about the cup of suffering, right? Garden of Gethsemane. If this cup can pass from me, then Father, let it pass from me. But if not, not my will but your will be done. That's the same cup that he's telling them they're going to have to drink of, the cup of suffering. And possibly even he's telling them, yes, you can, you can have these places of authority, but you might be killed for that, that position. And, and the Lord, I think, is still today showing us the same thing. Are we willing to the death to lay our lives down for Christ? And um, I think in the, the America that we live in, um, it's easy to say yes, but again, persecution may turn into more than snickering and snide comments um, in our near future. And, uh, and we'll be tested whether our faith will endure. Will we keep trusting the Lord? And uh, James had to go through that here. And he says, uh, James and, and John say, yes, we can. We can drink of your cup of suffering. We can be baptized with the baptism you're baptized with. Again, talking about the type of death he would die. And then uh, Jesus said, you shall drink, indeed drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. 
So he's telling them, he's prophesying that they're going to suffer, they're going to die in a tragic way. Whether they fully wrap their heads around that or not, they were just thinking glory, right? That's all we do too. We just think glory, but we don't think the cost of getting to that glory. And uh, I think with James now, if you see James in eternity, he would say it was worth it. It was worth it. Um, to not renounce his Lord and no matter what he went through, um, he's, he's in glory now and he's in a place that his mom tried to secure for him. He's in a place and we, we'll, see, we'll see that uh, when we get to heaven as well. So James was probably in his late 30s when he was killed. A believer cannot take a promise of God such as Mark 11:24 24 and many other such scriptures and use them against the will of God. All right, so look at Mark 11, 24, and, um, and let's look at that so we know what we're looking at here. Um, Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. So you can ask anything in his name, which means in his authority, right? He puts his signet ring signature upon what you're asking for, but the condition is that you're asking according to what? His will. His desires. How often do I pray? How often do you pray? And the classic uh, response that we get, we want a yes or no, right? But how often is the classic response that God gives us, at least it's been that way in my experience, is God doesn't answer or he says, wait. And that none of us like that answer probably. I don't. <laughs> but sometimes he's saying, wait, because we're asking wrong. We're not asking according to his will. And if he gave us what we were asking for, he knows what it would cause in our life. And it would not be his purposes. It would not be what he wants. And so sometimes when God doesn't say yes or no, and we're all frustrated and mad because we don't hear his voice, we don't hear an answer, uh, we better be wise enough as we mature in our faith to say, God, am I asking wrong? Am I asking according to your will? I want, I really, truly want what you want. I desire what you desire. And God, I, I want um, what you want for my life. So while I'm asking this, and we can find scriptures to show that it's God's will, what we're asking for from other scriptures, but there's a specific uh, thing that God may be wanting to do in a situation, and we need to trust the Lord um, for his direction on those things. All right, all these great promises of necessity, and it should be obvious, are subject to the will of God. So we can ask God, but we should ask him for big things. I don't think we ask God for enough. If the depth of our prayer life is God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food. In Jesus' name, amen. Then I don't think you're using Mark 11:24 to the extent God really wanted you to. He will bless your food, yes. And how often do we say, I had a professor in Bible college, he used to get really frustrated. I didn't used to get frustrated until I heard him talk about it. But we, how often do we pray in our prayers, God be with us? God be with us. And it really, you don't have to pray that if you're a believer and there's two or three of you there. He's promised, I'm in your midst, right? So we need to go deeper is what I'm trying to say, not to nitpick about your prayer life, but... But go deeper and ask God for big things. What about those unsaved family members? Who's the worst sinner in your family? That seems the most impossible to get saved. Why not say, God, I know you want them saved. I know you want them born again and free from their bondage. And begin to ask God for big things. Amen? And we, we, we so often get so busy in the mundane, the things that really aren't going to matter when the trumpet sounds, that we're just saying our cute little prayers that we learned as kids or something similar, and we're not really wrestling with God and saying, God, we need this. This is, this is what our church needs. This is what my family needs. This is what our community needs. This is what our nation needs, amen? And we need to um, lay hold of God's promises and ask him to, to tear down strongholds. We do not know why the Lord allowed Herod to kill James. Everything that happens is either caused or allowed by the Lord, right? The Bible indicates that. But why God allowed that? I mean, all you can have is speculation. I know, I know we'll know one day when we get to heaven why God allowed that. And I guarantee you it's for a redemptive purpose. James lost his life, but again, how many more people heard the gospel and got saved 
even through what seemed to be a horrible tragedy. It was a horrible tragedy. Um, but God, God doesn't always allow us to see all the whys of the bad things that happen to us in our lives. But he either causes it or he allows it. And he, he knows what's best for us. And sometimes it's hard to believe that when it's hitting you in the face. But we need to trust the Lord and that his purposes are being uh, fulfilled. God does all things well and always for our good. So as hurtful as this was for the moment, overall... <coughs> It was what was best for the for the church and what the move of God that was happening at this time. All right, let's look at verses three through seventeen of uh, chapter twelve. Get back to Acts here. All right, starting with verse three. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread, and when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison, and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side, and raised him up, saying, Arise, up, quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird yourself, and bind on your sandals. And so he did, and he said unto him, Cast your garment about you, and follow me. And he went and followed him, and knew not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leads unto the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel, and has delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And verse 12, And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark where many were gathered together praying. As Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to, uh, to hearken, named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told Peter, told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, You are mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with a hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. All right, so what a powerful miracle, right, that takes place here. Poor Peter, at least he was persistent to keep knocking, right? <laughs> they didn't know what, what was going on. If it was a ghost or what was happening there. Uh, but the Lord had performed a miracle. All right, this is the third imprisonment of Peter, which is recorded in the book of Acts. We saw um, other instances in chapter 4 and chapter 5. And there were 16 guards. There were four watches of four soldiers each. Two of them were physically chained to Peter, and two more guarded the immediate entrance. Why would they do that? They obviously respected the power of God or saw something that they felt he needed 16 soldiers to make sure he didn't get out. That's a testimony, I think. That's powerful. And it didn't work anyway. <laughs> no matter what they had devised to keep him, um, God's power was stronger. And that's, that's a testimony to us today. The phrase, and because he saw it please the Jews, proclaims this, was, this which is indicative of too many politicians. They want to please certain groups, so we'll set aside that which they know to be right. We see that happening all parties too yeah. much in the day and age that we're living in, isn't it? Yes. And it's corrupting our nation. We ought to be praying, God, and there's scriptures that back this up too, that you ought to pray into when you pray this. But God, those who are abusing their power, because Romans 13, chapter 14 says that all powers that be are ordained of God. They're either allowed or caused by God. So he, he's well aware of who's in power, but we ought to pray for our leaders, number one, 
But if they're abusing their power, God depose these leaders. Remove them from office and give us leaders of principle, leaders who will lead us in the right direction, who will do what is right. And I think as the people of God, we better be praying that. Amen? In these last days, even for our own. Used to be we were praying that for the rest of the world, right? But we better be praying that for our own country, that uh, those who are uh, abusing their power, using their position for personal gain, um, that God would see it and that he would judge righteous judgment. And, uh, and of course, you need to get out and vote as well. Do your part and, and pray. But um, God, God uh, he puts wicked, wicked rulers over or allows wicked rulers over people when we become wicked. He gives us the choice that we've made. Uh, but we need to say, God, have mercy. If we're not saying as the church, God, have mercy, the world isn't. The world is, is um, going deeper and deeper into sin and in corruption. And uh, we need to pray that God helps us in, in that. Preachers are prone to do things which oppose the word of God because it pleases denominational heads. I speak of action and conduct toward others also in Christ. The believer has but one responsibility and that is to please God. All else must take second place or no place at all. And you can see that in Peter and James and John, where they're faced with many times in the book of Acts, whether they have to choose to obey God or to obey men. Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes says, you can't preach anymore. But in their heart, they knew, because the word of God was like fire shut up in their bones, they weren't going to be able to obey those commands. And uh, so they had to choose, am I going to obey God and do what he's told me to do, or am I going to do what these men are, are trying to put upon me? And we have to discern that. We have to understand spiritual authority, because God has placed spiritual authority within the church. But when the spiritual authority begins to ask you to do things contrary to God's word, and contrary to what the Lord is saying to you, and is confirmed in, your, in the word of God, then you have to make a decision. God, am I going to obey you? Or am I going to obey man? And uh, we can see the disciples face that many, many different times in the book of Acts. And God prospered them when they obeyed his direction and his leading. And he'll do the same for us uh, in the day that we're living in. After the seven days of Passover season, Herod was intending to bring Peter before the people and make a spectacle of his condemnation. God, for some reason, didn't allow that to happen. Again, why did he allow James to be martyred and Peter to be miraculously saved? Only God knows. But we have to trust his sovereignty. There's still apparently something more that God is going to do in Peter and through Peter. And so the time is not uh, up for Peter yet. Um, but we have to trust the Lord's sovereignty. Herod didn't get the opportunity to make a spectacle of Peter at this time. All right, James chapter 5 and verse 16. Can someone read that for us? James chapter 5 and verse 16. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. All right, ladies, I think you're included in that promise as well. It's not intended to exclude you. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman, made righteous not by your doings, but by Christ's doings. It accomplishes much. These people were praying for Peter. And that's why this miracle happened. God responded to the prayer of faith. Amen? What spins in God's economy is faith. Will we believe him? And if we will believe him and take him at his word, God responds to faith. And uh, that's what we see happening here. While the Christians were continuing in fervent prayer during what in Agrippa's intention was to be Peter's last night on earth, their prayer unknown to themselves was receiving an effective answer. And sometimes it seems the darkest and the prayers are not being answered. God's moving while we're sleeping. Amen? Right. We go to bed discouraged and going, God, I don't even know if you're hearing me anymore. I've prayed this a hundred times, kicking the dirt, right? What was me? And then we wake up and find out God's done a miracle. Or he's moving in a certain way in response to that prayer. We need to pray in faith and believe the Lord and, uh, and trust him uh, for those answers. A hundred percent of the prayers you never pray, you never get answered. That's deep, so write it down. 
100% of the prayers you never pray will never get answered. Most of the time, and Jesus, that's confirmed in James, isn't it? You have not because you ask not. If we would pray before we try 16 other things, amen, Romy, pray about that situation, especially the problem, the challenges in our life. Um, 100% of the prayers we never pray won't get answered. So why not say, God, I need you in this. I need you to help me in this. Give me wisdom. Help my family. Help my finances. Help whatever it is that's going on. And give God an opportunity to, to work in that situation. The phrase, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him, presents the greatest weapon at the disposal of the church. A weapon so strong, in fact, that there is absolutely nothing that cannot be done, providing, of course, it is the will of God. Faith like that that will pray and take God at his word, that's what moves mountains. Just as a grain of mustard seed, you don't have to have gigantic faith, that word gigantic again. You don't have to have big faith, just a little bit of faith, and pray and trust God, it can move mountains. It's a powerful weapon. And uh, a lot of times the devil has us convinced, well, all I can do is pray. All you can do is pray. <laughs> That's powerful. That's and if we understood how uh, silly that sounds, I think we'll understand how silly that sounds when we get to heaven. All I can do is pray. Um, that's sometimes all we need to be doing, less talking about the situation and saying, God, I'm giving this to you and trusting you and taking you at your word. Um, their only hope was God, as is overly obvious, as God is our only hope in any situation. So it's very foolish for believers to resort to men. And we do that. We resort, to, I mean, if not to other men or what's popular in society or popular in the church world, trends and fads, don't we have trends and fads that come through the church even? And everybody tries this for a little while and they realize this isn't working. And then we get, and it's, it's just, it's man's idea. It wasn't God's idea to begin with. Um, but oftentimes if it's not somebody else talking about men's solutions, it's the work of our own hands. I can make this happen. And my determination and my willpower, and that's the offering of Cain. I can give God my best it may not be what he's asking for, but I'm going to give him my best. God's not wanting that. He wants you to trust his sacrifice, trust his plan, trust his redemption plan, and go his way by the way that his word teaches. And if we'll do that instead of trusting men, pray about things. Find scriptures that address whatever it is you're struggling with, whatever battle you're facing, and stand on God's word. Print it out and put it on the wall if you have to. Amen? When you're sick, I've had many times when I was sick and I didn't know what was going on. The doctors didn't either. And I started putting scriptures on the wall of the verses where God promises that he will bring healing. And I'll tell you what, I didn't have a miracle the first day I put those scriptures on the wall, but it kept my mind where it needed to be. Amen? Kept me from losing my mind, literally, uh, in the midst of that, that battle. And I was able to know, God, you've got this. You're in control. Whereas before that, my mind was going all over the place. Am I dying? Am I, you know, what's going on with me? Because even the doctors didn't know. And there's time, in any situation that we're facing, we need to find scriptures to stand on and pray and say, God, I'm giving this to you, and I'm trusting that you're sovereign, you're in control, and you can fix this situation. And that's what these saints were doing for Peter while he's in prison. There's nothing they can do about it. He's got 16 soldiers guarding him. It's not like they're going to go do a, a rescue run, right? <laughs> a jailbreak. Uh, they had to trust the Lord. And the Lord came through. He, he worked a miracle in this situation. And he'll do the same for us um, in what we're facing today. All right. A large number of the Jerusalem believers gathered for prayer in this house, probably in the same upper room where they met earlier in the book of Acts. And, uh, we see that in Acts 1.13. What if Rhoda had had little concern about what was happening, even as many believers and would not have bothered being in this prayer meeting, and especially considering it was probably between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. I like to sleep during that time. I don't know about you. But sometimes God calls you to prayer. And if he wakes you up in the middle of the night and you don't know why, say, God, is there somebody I'm supposed to be praying for? Because then as soon as you pray for him, you can go back to sleep, right? If you do what you're supposed to be doing. And I believe that happens, don't you? Sometimes God wakes you up. 
and there's somebody, and if somebody comes to your mind, that's probably who God wants you to be praying for. And if somebody doesn't come to your mind, I've learned, ask. Amen? Lord, who is it that, that needs uh, a touch from you right now? And, um, and, and the, Lord, the Lord gives his beloved sleep. He's not just going to torment you for no reason. Um, so, so Rhoda being obedient was very crucial in this whole story. She would have missed out on one of the greatest happenings in history and a great reward given her by the Lord for the t simple task of going to the door, to the gate, thereby proving her faithfulness. She went and, and that's where she saw Peter. I mean, she was so excited and so happy that she didn't let him in. She went running back into the house, but um, wouldn't you have been excited if what you've been praying for all night, God brings the breakthrough, God brings the answer, and uh, the Lord used her in a powerful way there. And again, all I can do is pray. Rhoda probably said that, right? All I can do is pray. And look how the Lord used her obedience, her faithfulness, just to pray uh, to see that situation happen. All right, let's look at verses uh, 18 through 23 of chapter 12. Now, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers that was be what, what, what was become of Peter. And when Herod sought for him, and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon, but they came with one accord to him. And having made Blastus, the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace, because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God, and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. All right? Uh, God will not share his glory with another. It's in Isaiah, isn't it? And this is a, a, a graphic example that God doesn't play around with this kind of stuff. Does he do this every time? No. But the depth of Herod's wickedness and corruption was so bad, God said, okay, you're done. And so um, we better understand a righteous, holy God that we serve. And we shouldn't be manipulating um, his righteousness, his holiness for our own benefit. He is altogether holy. He's altogether righteous. And we ought to be in submission to his, his majesty, his holiness and understand that we're we're created he is creator amen we don't as it says in uh i think it's in the new testament shall the shall the thing form say to him that formed it can the clay say to the potter why did you make me this way why are you shaping me in this way that's not our place god is sovereign he is holy he is righteous uh, he's our creator and um when when herod acts like this um, God acts uh, very abruptly and instantly um, and addresses it. According to the Jewish historian Josephus, the outer robe of Herod was of silver, either adorned with silver or actually woven of silver threads. Josephus also adds that the sun's rays were reflected brilliantly from Herod's silver robe. He didn't have a low self-esteem problem, if you read the history of Herod. Um, most of the Herod from that family, that line. They were very arrogant, very, they thought they were, they literally thought they were a god. Um, and the Roman Empire set them up like that. And so, um, but, but uh, had great riches and, and power and authority, um, you know, maybe probably gotten by corrupt ways, but God uh, sees it and he, he is going to intervene. And uh, we, we should know today, as I said before, God's going to intervene when wickedness and abuse of power is taking place. It won't go unnoticed by God forever. It's going to be judged. And, uh, and for uh, the benefit of people now, I mean, in eternity, it's going to be judged. We know that. But for the benefit of people, if people's lives are at stake, we ought to say, God, stop this. And God, stop this, uh, this perversion of justice, this, this uh, abuse of power, this... Um, people ruling for right for for um, 
for personal purposes to, to become rich. And our forefathers in this country, there's many of them, you can find quotes about it if you research it, and it doesn't take much deep research. Our country was not founded for someone who is a pauper to end up going through political office and to leave as a millionaire or a billionaire. And that's happening far too often, no matter what political party. And God sees that, and he is going to judge righteous judgment, whether it's now, immediately, or whether it's in the future. Um, it's going to happen because it's not right. And we ought to pray, God help us. God help us to not be having a country that's producing that kind of corruption. And, um, and we, we need to see what's going on in the day and age that we're living in. All right, Josephus recorded this event as a festival in honor of the Roman Emperor Claudius. But Herod gave an extended oration or speech. Many of his hearers continued to exalt him as a god. Instead of preventing a problem, he basked in it. And an angel of the Lord suddenly smote him. According to Josephus, Herod lingered for five days, and his flesh so rotted that the condition actually produced maggots, which ate his flesh. Again, don't you think God allowed that? To show how ugly sin is, how, how deadly it is to submit to such arrogant pride, to think that you're God, that you can stand in the face of God. Um, he made it clear that that's, that's foolish. And it's, it's something we should take warning from today. Someone has said his pride, so deflated by Peter's escape, was greatly puffed up again by the flattering cries of these people who called him a god. Furthermore, he not only accepted their worship, but actually encouraged it. When he laid his hands on James and then attempted the same with Peter, he at the same time touched the Lord. No one touches in a negative way that which belongs to God without touching God. There's many examples of that in Scripture. Uh, Matthew 25 is a big one. As well as a battle that no person can win, irrespective to whom they may be. Uh, and as we talked about in the, the story of Peter with the sheep that came down, and God says, don't call common or unclean what I have called holy and clean. Um, Touch not God's anointed. Matthew 25, where it says, if you minister to the least of these, what? You've ministered to me. And so um, we ought to be very careful about um, our interaction um, you know, with other people. Let God do the judging as far as the condemnation part. We like to be the judge, jury, and executioner. But let God, as long as someone's breathing, there's still room for God's grace in their life. And you are thankful for yourself that that's the case. Be thankful for that person. As long as they're on this side of eternity, this side of the grave, God still has a chance to work on them. And uh, don't judge them as beyond help. That's not our, we are to judge in the sense of discerning fruit, evidence in someone's life. And a tree is known by its fruit. Jesus did direct us in that. But it's not our, there's one righteous judge of all the earth. And it says, he shall do right. And he, there's one, one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. I think the book of James says that. That's talking about condemnation. Someone is so far gone that they're beyond hell. We're not, that's not our judgment to make. That's, thank God that's not our judgment to make. Because nobody would make it to heaven. <laughs> Amen? But, um, but God, leave that to the Lord. And, and we ought to say, God, bring them to repentance. If they won't come to repentance, then God, you judge righteous judgment. But God, it's not my job to do the righteous judgment. It's yours. And uh, as long as they're breathing, as long as they're on this side of the grave, there's room for the grace of God to work in their lives. And we ought to um, pray that way. All right, whether it's a politician, whether it's a family member that's hurt us, whether it's someone who fell in our, in our church world, uh, we ought to pray, God, you are the one who's in control of that. Amen? And let, let him be the one who makes the decisions on that. Uh, with failure, or the failure to give God the glory is committed constantly, all right? Um, in the Christian world, in the modern church, there's so much that's done, and God can't bless it because man is taking the glory for what he rightly deserves. Um, Christian music is a big one. There's a lot of lyrics that are perfectly scriptural, good lyrics to a song, 
in Christian music, but the Lord can't bless it because the artist or the record label or somebody is taking the glory for what God is wanting to do. And we better be careful. We, better, we want the Spirit of God to be in our worship, in our music, in what's influencing our hearts. And He wants the glory. Amen? It should say, look at Jesus, look at Jesus, look at Jesus. Not look at me, look at me, look at me. And uh, money has corrupted a lot of things. God should get the glory, but because money is involved, uh, something else is getting the glory other than God. And he responds in an abrupt way here. And I'll show us he's, he's not playing games about his glory. Um, at this present time, almost the entirety of America gives the glory of our prosperity to everything other than God. Politicians are lauded along with major universities, etc., but glory is seldom given to God from whom all blessings flow. The reason why we're blessed as a nation, the reason why we're the last remaining superpower is because we were founded on godly Christian principles, is what I believe, and our greatest export historically, though it has waned in recent years, our greatest export from this country has been the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we're blessed. That's why God has been so merciful to us. If that changes, those mercies can go, though. We need to say God continue to use... They're sending missionaries to us, whereas we used to be the greatest missionary sending nation in the world. They're actually sending missionaries from other countries here because of what they see on the news, in the international news. And I hate to say we probably need it. We definitely need it. Even though we have a church on every corner in most major cities, we need an adequate presentation of who Jesus is and what righteousness really is and what holiness really is. And if it takes somebody from Argentina or South Africa or someplace else to come here and tell people that because we're too caught up in self, glorying in the wrong things, then God send them. Send them here. But Lord, wake us up, amen, as the church, and help us to realize that the blessings of our nation are because of, of God and what he's uh, called us to do. The Jews failed to bring the gospel to the world. That was their responsibility. That was their greatest failure. And it's now the church's responsibility to take the gospel to the world. And that's why God has blessed our nation, is because of uh, the good news going out from, from this place. And that's, again, why we should say, God, restore our freedoms. Not so I can have money in my pocket, drive a nice car, live in a two-story house, the American dream, right? Even if you don't have anything that looks anywhere near the American dream, if we have the freedom so that we can do what we're doing tonight, we ought to thank God and the freedom to tell others what Jesus can do in their life. That's what we need the freedom for. That's what we need God to move in our nation for one last time because there's still a lot of people that need Jesus. They don't need more money in their pocket. They don't need what everybody in the world says they need. Most of what the world, you turn on the television commercials and you need this, and you're just like, no, I don't think any, but someone who's lost, they believe all that stuff. What they need is Jesus. And we need to pray uh, in that way for, for God to help us. All right, let's look at these last two verses, and then uh, we will finish up tonight. The word of God grew and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So all this stuff is going on, crazy stuff, right, in the New Testament church. But verse 24, but in the midst of that, the word of God grew and multiply. God in 2024, though we're in a mess, though our families are a mess, though our communities are a mess, though our nation is going in so many wrong directions, God, would you help the Word of God to grow and multiply in our day and age? Amen? Um, God wants to do it. He's looking for a people who will uh, be vessels that He can flow through. All right, so preparation. Every single thing done for the Lord must be based squarely on the Word. When this is done, the tremendous benefits of the word begin to be brought about, which results in many people being saved, healed, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and blessed in every conceivable way. If the word of God does not grow and multiply, nothing is accomplished for the Lord. The reason is simple. The Holy Spirit will only anoint truth, which is the word. And John 17, 17 talks about that. And... Um, we, we want God to help 
uh, the word of God to grow. Um, what is it? Psalms 119, it says, um, I'm trying to remember how it goes now. Psalm 119 is one of them that says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. We don't know what sin is if the word of God is not prevalent in our minds, in our society. And when, when wickedness goes unchecked, as we're seeing in the time we're living in now, um, where we're allowing people to walk into convenience stores in our major cities and take their arm and clear off a whole aisle of stuff, and as long as it's less than $1,000, the police won't even show up. God help us. God help us. We're in a horror. If, if wickedness goes unchecked, if the word of God is not prevalent in our thinking, in our society, which is all of our laws are based off the word of God, right? Off the Ten Commandments, off the, the laws that God gave in the Old Covenant even. Um, if we get away from that, uh, we're, we're definitely head, headed towards anarchy. We're headed towards um, a crazy time. We need truth to prevail. And it's going to take the body of Christ standing up, even if we're the one voice in a million, the one voice in a thousand, saying this is not right. And uh, because um, the Holy Spirit can't, he can't bless something that's not true, that's not according to his word. And we need to be careful. And they may say, well, the politicians just say, well, CVS and Walgreens and all these stores, they just need to close, the, close their stores and move elsewhere. And they enact all these laws that are unjust about all this stuff. No, somebody needs to stand up and have the courage to say this is wrong. And we should be a nation of law and order. We should be a nation who, who uh, when someone commits a crime, they, they are punished for that. Amen. Because if wickedness goes unchecked, it's only going to grow. But if the word of God grows and multiplies in a society, um, then people have an opportunity for truth. And truth is what will make the change in, in your heart. What is it, John chapter 8? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And these people are bound up by demonic spirits that are influencing them. I mean, these mob mentality crimes that are going on. Um, we need to say, God, let your truth prevail. Amen. And, and pray that God moves in that situation. It is important not to rush into a ministry before one is ready by the grace of God to handle its responsibilities. And we can see that in uh, Barnabas and Saul and what's going on in, in uh, uh, Saul's preparation. What a privilege this young man had to be associated with both Paul and Barnabas. What an opportunity was his. How so much the Lord favored him by opening this door. And remember, Barnabas was brought alongside Paul as an encourager to help him. He had been a persecutor of the church, and now he's being used of God to win people to the Lord. And so Barnabas had an instrumental role. And if you're that encourager that God has gifted to encourage somebody, again, you may say, well, all I can do is pray. Well, all I can do is encourage. Well, all you did, Barnabas, was help the man who authored 13 books of the New Testament by your encouragement. All you did, Barnabas, was encourage a man that though he faced suffering like no other human other than Jesus, probably, or maybe Job, to do what he was called to do, he went on three missionary journeys, and there's a Western church today in our country, in the United States of America, because someone was willing to be the encourager and to be with Paul on the backside of the desert and let him be trained and let him be prepared for what was going to come in his future. Amen? And so whatever role God has you playing or fulfilling within the body of Christ, don't let the enemy minimize it. You be faithful. You be... Um, obedient and consistent with the Lord's help. Be consistent. Um, and the Lord can take what's little and He can make much out of it. Amen? Amen. He can use it for the kingdom of God and um, we can see uh, great things accomplished for His glory. And He gets the glory when we're trusting Him. If we could do it all in our own strength, then we would get the glory. But when our strength is at its worst, His strength is made perfect in our weakness, right? And he gets the glory. So uh, just keep being faithful to the Lord. And I think there's a lot of lessons in this chapter 12 that we can apply to our own personal walk and what's going on right now in our own nation, our own country. And uh, let's let the Lord use us to be the intercessor. And then the one standing in the gap and saying, God, no more. This has to stop. 
and uh, that righteousness would prevail. All right, any other comments, concerns, criticisms about chapter 12? Yes. Yeah. Well, what did Jesus say? Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And he was really addressing the head knowledge, I think, if you look at the context of that verse. These Pharisees and Sadducees, they could quote scriptures like this, but they weren't applying them. And Jesus said, search the scripture, for in them you think you have eternal life, and the scriptures are the things that testify about me and what I can do for you, and God can do anything for us. He's unlimited. Uh, we're the ones that limit God, and we're the ones who are limited. But God is not limited. And if we'll search the scriptures, I agree. There's an answer for everything. It may not be the answer we want sometimes, but there's an answer for everything. And it will direct us. And God intended his word to be a guide map for us. Um, yeah, definitely.